For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and you're listening to this podcast, which is a part of the Inside Carolina Podcast Network. On today's episode, I'm joined by my fellow Carolina football letterman, Mike Ingersoll and EJ Wilson, to talk about Carolina's big win against Virginia. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Be sure you subscribe to Inside Carolina wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube so you never miss out on any of the content the team at IC puts out. The support doesn't go unnoticed on this end. All right, it's Mike Ingersoll and EJ Wilson. Carolina, for the second consecutive week, scores 59 points, beating UVA 59-39 to to get back to 1-1 one and one in ACC play. Big win for the Tar Heels. The Tar Heels outscored the Wahoos 35-11 to in the second half. A lot to talk about, a lot to break down. Let's get started with you, Mike. What were your biggest takeaways? Uh, takeaway number one here on the positivity pod for this week is that we don't, we shouldn't need to score 60 points to beat people. Uh, takeaway number two is that I, I guess somebody heard me, you know, crying a river about things we weren't doing well on the offensive line and they corrected it. And I think that somebody, um, whoever it was deserves a, a huge pat on the back because the offensive line looked night and day from what they have. There were still some mistakes, Uh, I think Brian Anderson's playing hurt. I don't have anything to support that. That's pure speculation. But based on what I'm seeing and based on how I know he can play, I think he's currently playing hurt. Um, But, you know, with that said, we've got Q Johnson as a more than capable uh, replacement. And I thought Q played very well yesterday. Um, Or I guess for the folks who are listening to this on Monday, played very well on Saturday. Um, So, my yeah, that's my two biggest takeaways is that, you know, we need – we're apparently going to need to keep scoring a million points – but if we score a million points and we keep blocking it up like we did here up front, then, you know, we might be successful. I still think that my eight and four prediction is accurate, but I, uh, I hope that I'm proven wrong by the end of the season. EJ, what about you? What were your biggest takeaways? Uh, takeaway number one, uh, Kimon Rucker and Jaquarius Conley look really, really good out there. Kimon gave us a much needed pass rush. I mean, and I mean, from, from an array of, of different pass rush moves. I mean, one time it was a power rush, the other time it was a speed rush. So I was really impressed by that. And I and, and just how he was running around the field. So I was really happy to, to see some of our young guys play better. Jaquarius, I mean, that, the interception he got with, with the cast on his hand, it was just an unbelievable play. And I mean, this is kind of what we were talking about when we said that he looks like the player that we want on our defense. He just Look, he just stands out and kind of looks like NFL talent out there on the field. So I was really happy about what I saw about that. Uh, two, we, we stopped the run. Uh, I guess you can take that as you may from really what they were trying to do with running the ball. They didn't really need to, but we were effective against the run. Uh, three, our blitzing is effective, but the coverage behind it is not very effective. We got burnt on big play after big play. Um, we, we, we definitely got hurt by by the, the huge tight end that they had. Tony Grimes uh, had a hard night covering him all night. But it, it was a lot of back and forth. I wouldn't say that that was a one-sided battle. But whatever's going on in the coverage behind our pressures, we need to fix it, and we need to fix it fast. Yeah, I think my biggest takeaways were this doesn't feel like a game that the old Carolina football teams would have won after, after they gave up that touchdown at the halftime. I know the mood in Keenan Stadium – was was not well a lot of people were questioning that decision whether or not to kick the field goal even in the first place where you give Virginia the short field and then and then Virginia goes down and scores I don't think that's a play that the teams in the past kind of come back from and then I think the other play that kind of fits along that going off the defense not playing their best game was the the play where Des Evans almost had that sack on a on a big third mm-hmm. down and would have got Carolina off the field. I don't think old Carolina defenses could bounce back from that, but you know they they did hold strong to end the game and it's it's kind of something where it it's, it sounds crazy to say where the numbers kind of feel misleading on the defense when you look at a game that has so many possessions. I think Virginia had 12 possessions counting that last one and they scored touchdowns on five of them. So I think from from a five out of 12 perspective, that's not bad when you're getting the offense that everybody was kind of expecting going into the year. And along along those lines, I think the offensive line deserves a ton of credit for this week. They they took a, a ton of flack after week one. Not Not all of it was deserving. They took a ton of flack after week two. They... Most of it was deserving. Most of that one was deserving. And then all week they had, you know, their toughness question. They had their depth question. And without, 
you know, Brian Anderson, not a hundred percent, Jordan Tucker, not a hundred percent, Josh Azudu, not a hundred percent. When you look at the snap counts for the offensive line, those three were, were the lowest snap counts for that offensive line. So with this, with this patchwork offensive line, they put together their best performance, which leads to the next question I wanted to ask you, Mike, where I thought the offensive line were the biggest winners. What changed from week two to week three, where it looked like this was the offensive line where we were kind of expecting them to be, especially without um, Josh Azudu, Jordan Tucker, and Brian Anderson for a majority of this game? Well, Virginia ran for most of the game three-man fronts, and I, I didn't see – I didn't see a lot of multiple looks from them. So we sort of got bailed out a little bit by some vanilla fronts. Uh, but that I don't, I don't mean for that to take away from the, the actual production that the offensive line had because they handled their one-on-one assignments much better than they have previously. Um, and I'm talking in pass protection. In the run game, we looked pretty good. Obviously, we ran the ball for you know a million yards. Um, but I think a lot of that was reminiscent of – Michael Carter, Javante Williams type of rushing attacks where our running backs made us look good. We were able to use Sam Howell in the running game and sort of open things up, uh, which is one thing we talked about last week that clearly got thrown in the game plan and was very effective. Um, you know, so they, they had the benefit of some misdirection stuff in the run game uh, on our side of the ball, um, some play calling advantages against some relatively vanilla fronts that we were able to block up and execute as they should be executed. Um, you know, if you can't handle the the one on one single blocks, if you can't handle your vanilla fronts, if you can't handle, you know, your 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 basic, you know, single blitzer packages and things like that, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And uh, I don't think Virginia gave us the types of movement up front that I expected to see, but we executed our assignments well when we got, you know, we clearly knew what was coming. They knew that our guys knew the game plan. They were prepared to go out there and play. They they knew what was coming when Virginia was showing some looks. Uh, and they were able to pick that up for the most part. The one thing that concerned me was um, Virginia got us off the backside a few times in the run game that we're going to need to clean up. And one of those was on a pick and will on 30 or 30 would be 37 power pick and will is where the backside tackle basically stabs down, make sure the three technique doesn't loop out and then wheels back around and it basically just creates a wall on the backside. EJ knows the technique that I'm talking about creates the backside on a, um, creates a wall on the backside of a power or gap scheme play. Um, I actually saw that backside defensive end blow up a power in the backfield um, from, from that backside position. And that should never happen. And there was nothing really special about what happened, you know, from a, from a front standpoint or from a look standpoint on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, we just took bad steps on that and we we're going to clean that, that up. And that was just one, that was just one play. Uh, but it, it, there were a few times where I saw backside pressure and backside free runners, which, you know, if you're going to let somebody run free, it's usually somebody off the backside in the run game. I saw those guys making the play. We're going to have to start accounting for them and doing something about that. If we're going to continue to have success on the ground. Yeah. You mentioned last week too, that we talked about does Sam Howell have to be part of the running game for this team to be successful. And I think we got the answer this week that he does and yeah. he, he is more than capable as a runner he rushed for 15 attempts 112 yards out there I saw a stat that it was the first time a quarterback has thrown for 300 plus yards and rushed for 100 plus yards um, back-to-back weeks since Lamar Jackson so it's Lamar Jackson it's Sam Howell in the run game um, kind of kind of crazy company to hear that but I think that's that's something Carolina is going to have to uh, keep going with in the game plan for future. And I think you, you'd like to see Sam Howell start sliding at all. But, uh, <laughs> at all. At, just once. Just yeah. once. I, he, he, he loves going for the contact and fighting for the extra two to three yards. I think somebody has to get in his ear and say, hey, we need you. We don't need those two to three yards as much as we need you to play against Georgia Tech and Duke and Florida State and Miami. But Sam Howell, he's he's a gamer. It's it gets to the point where I did my post game recap video and I realized at the end of it I didn't even talk about Sam Howell after the kind of night he has. But it's just like it's 
year three, it's just kind of like what you expect now from Sam Howell to where, you know, if, if he's rushing for the, the hundred plus rushing yards is, is a lot and kind of out of his norm, but the 300 plus passing yards, how he puts the ball on a dime and really gives these receivers a chance. It, it feels like it's, it's nothing new to talk about. EJ, a, bit of advi- a bit of advice for Sam in the run game. Uh, Sam, if you, if you listen to this or if anybody gets you this clip, uh, when you're getting to the sideline, get your ass to the sideline and stop pointing and trying to draw a flag. <laughs> Just get to the sideline, let them hit you, then get the flag, but don't try to draw contact because yeah. because somebody's going to light you up and then we've got big problems. So just if you're running to the sideline, don't throttle oh, yeah. it down three yards before and start pointing and try to tell the ref like, Oh, I'm going out of bounds. Like <laughs> you're not Ryan Switzer, like just get to the sideline and get out of bounds and live the, live the play another play. Yeah, I, I missed the little the little high steps to the sideline um, that you saw from from past wide receivers for Carolina, but the Sam Howell in the run game it gives the defenses another another thing they have to prepare for. And Sam is obviously more than capable as a runner. But EJ, I mentioned it earlier, where on paper, if you really dissect UVA's possessions, they had twelve drives, they scored touchdowns on five of those, they got a field goal on another. They turned it over on two possessions. Carolina forced three punts, and then the the last possession, uh, UVA just kind of ran out of time there. As a defense, what does it do for you when you know your offense is firing on all cylinders and they're scoring 50-plus points to where you don't have to put together the best performances, but if you, if you are timely and you do force uh, – non-touchdown drives on seven of the 12 drives. What does that do for a defense? Uh, it, it definitely gives you a boost of confidence, but I mean, that's the last thing that you want to think. I mean, when you start thinking about that as a defensive player, you're really having a losing mentality. If you're saying that we're that, Oh, okay. We don't have to stop in this play. Or maybe if they only scored a field goal, or if they're scoring a touchdown, as long as our offense is scoring touchdowns, we're good. No, that's the losing mentality on the defensive side. But luckily we are in a position where because our defense has had some struggles that, um, that our offense has had our back, but I mean, let's got to take a, take a look at this game and what it really is. I mean, a, a three of those touchdowns where they scored to go up 28, 24 going into the half. I mean, a lot of those plays were kind of sudden change. You had the big interception, you had the, the long field goal attempt that was short. So a lot of those were, I mean, granted that, I mean, their quarterback was pretty much dicing us apart, but a lot of those, those that scoring that came majority of that was right in that time span. I mean, yeah, we, we, uh, we were able to stop the run and kind of make some plays, uh, and uh, we did have some some plays from our, some of our players who were expecting to play well. Javari Ritzy, uh, Miles Murphy. Um, I think Ray Vohasek had an awesome game. Jeremiah Gimmel made some huge plays for us. So um, we did see some big plays from some of our stars. But like I said, when we, we were we were pressuring a lot more and the coverage just wasn't there behind it. And then in the second half, their quarterback, uh, he was off of the spot. He wasn't as comfortable as he was. But a lot of the times their wide receivers were just – making plays over our DBs. They were just the better players on some of those plays. I mean, you think about the drive down that he dropped into the five, nine receiver. I mean, the six, seven, 265 uh, pound tight end. I mean, make, and, uh, what's his, the guy's name? Was it Mixon or something like that? Wixer or something. That guy was absolutely killing us all night. I mean, he looked like an all world wide receiver. So let's not think that this, this wasn't Georgia state. We were playing. These were very, these were high caliber, high caliber athletes we were playing against and we struggled in the secondary. So, I mean, I just don't like us having that mentality. And I think that if we can play more like we played in the third quarter with some of our playmakers making plays, us actually getting a pass rush without having to send five or six people, I think we'll be in better positions. But I do like what I saw from, from our defense, probably for, from the, the first, I'll say 12 to 17 minutes of the second half. But other than that, it was business as usual, the missed tackles, the blown coverages. But if we can put it together and just play a complete game, I mean, I I think that you'll start to see more of these games be 59 to zero. I mean, it's great in the second half that our offense was running the ball, controlling the clock and running the ball, even when they were expecting us to run the ball. So that definitely gave that defense some confidence, but we, we, we need to start winning some more of these games, 59 to 17, 59 to 20, or some something like that. It shouldn't be a shootout every game you play. Yeah, it was uh, Dontavian Wicks, uh, seven catches, 183 yards. I mean, he Brandon Armstrong threw for 554 yards. So somebody 
somebody was definitely going to be on the receiving end of a lot of those catches and a lot of those <laughs> yards. It was the most yards. I think I saw it was the most yards Carolina's ever given up uh, passing in a game. But mm-hmm. I, I guess the counter to that is that Carolina succeeded at making Virginia a one dimensional team where they basically shut down the rushing option. Car- uh, Virginia had, I think, 22 attempts for 21 yards. Uh, oh no, they held Virginia to 24 yards on the ground, 1.1 yards per carry. What did you see from Carolina up front to where they were able to limit Virginia on the ground? Because I think that was a point of emphasis for this team where to try to make Virginia emphasis, it, it kind of goes back to the toughness. Virginia wants to have that ball control offense. What did, what did you see that allowed Carolina to win up front? I think that we saw a lot more aggressiveness from our defensive line. And I think that you saw our linebackers um, in the right position and not looking as confused. I think Cedric Cedric Gray getting the start and playing the majority of this game had a big, a lot to do with us uh, playing the run so well. I mean, what was he able to make some of the athletic plays that Eugene Asante is able to make sometimes? No, but that only comes with playing experience. Did he look like he knew what he was doing? Yes. Did he make some great plays and show his athleticism and show why the coaching staff is so high on him? Yeah, he did. So I honestly think that that's a big reason. He allowed Jeremiah Gimmel was able to play freely and flow a little bit more. And he looked more like that player that we saw last night when he trusted the linebacker that was next to him. When, when Chaz Surratt was next to him, he was able to play a lot more freely. He was was able to be a lot more aggressive when he was blitzing so I do think that was a big change I mean and you also saw a lot more of our secondary getting involved in the running game I mean guys were coming up they were making hits our pressures were on time uh it, it really was uh, a night for where our pressures were we either weren't getting anywhere or we were causing confusion or we were getting tackles for loss so I really just saw a more aggressive game plan uh in the last couple of weeks I saw that we started to sit more pressure in the second half and I was excited to see that we saw Started that uh, from the beginning of the game, and I think that really affected uh, how they ran the ball. Yeah, we did want to make them one dimen- one dimensional team, but when we didn't expect that one dimension to be clicking on all cylinders like it was. I mean, yeah, we did blow some coverages, but I mean, he was out there dropping dimes like this. This wasn't just guys were wide open. Guys were making spectacular plays out there on both sides of the uh, of the field. So my um, hats off to them, but I mean, I, I definitely think that. Like you mentioned earlier, some of the things that we bounced back from, I mean, particularly Des Evans just having a really bad drive. I mean, he missed the sack and then he had the false start later on down. So, I mean, we usually guys want to be able to overcome that and bounce back. But uh, luckily, we're a talented team and we, we just kept the guys coming. I mean, big, big, big games from Taman Fox, Miles Murphy. Uh, everybody on the defensive line, uh, and I think really in the defensive front seven was very active and and really uh, did a good job at controlling the run. We just need to do a little, little bit uh, better, well, well, a lot better job on buttoning down some of that uh, coverage behind those pressures. Yeah, the secondary definitely needs uh, a lot of fixing after after last night. I think Brendan Armstrong. There's there's really nothing pretty about how he throws the ball or anything about his game, but I think. He is probably the best quarterback Carolina is going to face with some of the weapons that this Virginia team has. So if you're looking, if you're looking at that aspect of things, it, it's it should only get better for this Carolina secondary if the quarterbacks that they're versing are significantly less or even even slightly less talented. But Mike, a point we made last week was that we really didn't know what Carolina had in the running back room. And this week we saw when you get Ty Chandler to the second level, he's got that that breakaway speed, that great top end speed. He rushes for 198 yards on 20 carries. Caleb Hood adds in 66 yards on 7.7 yards per carry. What did you what did you think of the performances you got out of the running back room? I thought they were more patient than they've been. Previously, Ty Chandler specifically, we haven't seen a lot of Caleb Hood. Um, we've obviously seen a ton of Ch- Ty Chandler. He's been our starting running back. He he was much more patient this week than he has been in the previous two weeks. And I think a lot of that might be he was feeling out his offensive line. You know, you got to remember he was another pro. He was in a different program, you know, for four years or four plus years, you know, before he came here. So. You know, he's playing with new guys. He's got a new quarterback. He's in a new scheme, new offensive coordinator, new everything. Um, and he's also, he's, he's the every down guy for the most part. I mean, he's the guy. And at Tennessee, he was never the guy. 
Um, the reason he's, what is it, whatever it is, uh, fifth in all-purpose yards is because he was a man without a country. Mm-hmm. You know, to get on the field, he had to be returning kicks. He had to be catching passes. He had to be rushing. He had to do everything to get on the field. Um, and he was clearly effective in all of it. But it was almost like they made him a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none. Here, we're letting him be uh, – we're, we're letting we, – we've given him a home at that running back spot. And I think you finally started to see him get comfortable in that role. Uh, and, you know, the thing that made Michael Carter and Javante Williams so good – um, and, and continues to make them good, frankly. Um, Michael Carter has, you know, he's not rushing for a ton of yards for the Jets right now, but, you know, the carries he's getting, you can see the patience. He's just, he needs the blocking in front of him. Uh, Javante Williams had a decent day today, too. I think he had, what, 65 yards rushing today. I mean, for a rookie, that's, that's pretty good in the NFL. <laughs> um, um, you know, what makes them good and what made them good at Carolina was their patience and their field vision. You know, they understood when the hole was going to develop and where it would develop, and they gave the play time to develop and unfold in front of them before they hit the hole. Ty Chandler was doing a lot of that. Hood was doing a lot of that. Um, They were feeding off of each other, too. You saw that. And our offensive line did a really good job of getting up on the second level. Um, I want to give uh, Asim Richards a shout out here. Uh, I saw him on several single blocks just take his man, you know, from the point of attack five, six yards back. His technique was great. His elbows were tight. His hands were inside. His hips were underneath him. Um, you know, everything it, it text. I mean, just, just textbook, single blocks, textbook, one-on-one base blocks. Um, and, and there were a few times he sprang some runs. So I want to give him, I want to give credit where it's due. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and I stay Q Johnson. Um, I saw uh, Josh Azudu, uh, you know, spring a couple, you know, when he was in there, I saw Brian Anderson do some good things in a running game. And I, what I, the big thing that I was, most impressed was, was I saw our guys getting up on the second level and they didn't maintain their blocks at the second level for any real sustained period of time. But what they did do is they held those blocks long enough to where the running backs were able to make us look right, be able to make the offensive line look right, make the offensive line look good. And that was the thing that Javante and Michael were so good at last year and in previous years was making the offensive line look right, making them look good. And our running backs were able to do that because there was clearly – I don't know what happened in practice this past week, but there was clearly a comfort level. Uh, I think, again, I, I, I really think Ty Chandler is settling in and he feels comfortable now with the people in front of him. He knows this is his job. You know, this is his, this is his position. He's the starting running back. He can go out there and just play freely. I think that has, you know, that's a lot. Uh, that has a big impact on a player's confidence, particularly at the running back spot. And that, com- that combined with our offensive line, you know, clicking, as a unit, despite the patchwork hodgepodge line we saw, which you mentioned at the top of this podcast, uh, that group clicking combined with some patience and confidence back there at the running back spot allowed us to run the ball all over Virginia, you know, essentially at will. Um, you know, the only times we really got blown up, the only times we really got stopped is when there was a clear missed assignment. And that did happen a few times. We got to clean that stuff up. But, you know, this was, this was a, a big step in the right direction. And both running backs that played, you know, I would expect to see a lot more Caleb Hood moving forward. Um, you know, you've got a Ty Chandler who looks physically looks like a Sean drone out there. For those who remember the way Sean ran, the way he looked on the field, he looks and runs, you know, just from a, a just a running form standpoint, looks a lot like Sean out there. He sees things the way Sean saw things. Um, I think he's going to be a good player for us for the rest of the year. And Caleb Hood, you know, as he comes along, if he can put string together a couple of you know, two, three, four games like he had last night, you know, that that's a that's a very viable one-two punch. And that we've seen with the Michael Carter and Javante Williams era, we've seen Carolina's offense is at its best when it has a two-headed monster back there at running back with a quarterback who can supplement the running game. And obviously, you know, if we can throw for 300 plus yards and score 60 points, you know, that, that helps too. <laughs> the patience, I think you, you hit it on the head there that the patience was the difference for the running backs. And I think if you're also uh, Carolina, I think somebody has to send a, a gift basket to the, the UVA defender, uh, Mandy Alonzo, who kind of fueled this Carolina team, I think, saying that, uh, hold on, I have the quote here somewhere. They always try to come physical. It's our culture versus theirs. We're going to go harder, longer each play the whole game than they will. Even if they come out swinging, we just have to be able to sustain it. We know they can't sustain it because the past four years they haven't been able to, it, it just goes back to the point. I don't, I don't know why you say anything interesting in the lead up to, Cut the to their whole team cramping, <laughs> Cut to their whole team cramping, the star <laughs> defensive player getting banged up. 
what <laughs> there is almost no advantage to saying anything before a game um but ej that kind of leads right into the point i wanted to ask you as a quick follow-up to what mike was talking about in the rushing game uva their longest rush all night was seven yards carolina ty chandler's longest rush was 60 yards sam howell's longest rush was 20 Caleb Hood's longest was 25. Even Josh Henderson's longest rush was 14 yards, doubled up whatever Virginia's longest rush was. How demoralizing is that from a defensive perspective when you're you're trying to stick to your game plan, but something keeps happening where a defense is just gashing you for big rush after big rush, and then you ha- you find yourself having to chase down the play, try to get set up for the next play, but knowing that you're just giving up chunk yardages on the ground. Oh, it's the it's the most demoralizing thing that can happen. I mean, that's worse than somebody taking the top off of a defense. When somebody says man to man, I'm going to I'm going to line up to you. We're going to go one on one. We're going to see whose offensive line is the most disciplined, who's the who's front, who, who's stronger in the trenches. And it's basically a it's the most it's the most football thing that you could do is to just run the ball when you want to, when you have to and when you need to. That's what we did offensively yesterday. And that's what we stopped UVA from doing. I mean, yeah, we gave up a lot of uh, we gave up a lot in the passing game, but that can be fixed. What's harder to fix is guys going head to head and just just running the ball down your throat. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, we gave up a lot of passing arts last night, but what I'm most excited about is how we played the run. The UVA has some impressive athletes. They have they try to disguise their plays really well. They have a lot of quarterbacks out there that play in various positions, whether it be tight end, wide receiver, running back, wearing those ugly numbers, number 99, 98. I mean, it's the most terrible thing that I've ever ever seen but what can you expect from a head coach who goes by Bronco no shade all shade actually but yeah so I was gonna say I mean, I it's just was, impressive to see us go <laughs> a little bit just a little bit but um so yeah I mean I mean but but they, we went out there last night and, and we hit them in the mouth I mean the, I mean it, it's kind of like you hear going into the season that we have all these 300 pound plus bodies and they were just leaning on people. I mean, R- Ray Vahasek is going to destroy people every play, but you kind of saw that going down the line from uh, Ritzy. You saw that from uh, Miles Murphy. You saw that from anybody from Vernon. You saw that from anybody who came in on that offensive line. I mean, even Tamari Fox got involved and since he's kind of been delegated to pass for his duties. You even saw him involved in the run game last night, making some plays. So, I mean, it, it was just good to see. And I just hope that it has a lot of carryover to when we're playing a more traditional run style. And I mean, we're definitely going to need the next Saturday. Saturday down in the lamp. Mike, the the star of this game, it would have been Ty Chandler if it wasn't for Josh Downs. Josh Downs goes for 203 receiving yards on eight catches, two touchdowns. That one touchdown in the corner of the end zone was probably one of the best touchdowns I've ever seen live. Um, he took he takes that little screen or not the screen, but a, it's like a five yard route, takes it all the way. What did you see from Josh Downs? I mean, the kid can play and he's another one who's just confident and you see what confidence does for a player. You know, that orange bowl was sort of his, you know, hi, everybody, I'm here game. And he still didn't play that great. He had a couple drops in that game. Um, You could, you know, you could tell there was some nerves, but now he's just like Ty Chandler. He knows that he is the number one option. He's, he's, he's the number one wide wide receiver. That it's his room. It's his meeting room. uh, It's his position group. And he's going to be the, the number one option for Sam. And he also knows that when the ball's put in his hands, he's going to produce. And confidence just begets more confidence. And you're going to keep seeing that, I think, from him so long as he stays healthy. Um, but he's, he's so fast and he's so shifty. And he is now the guy. I mean, I complained and you complained. and We all complained after the Virginia Tech game that nobody was getting separation at the wide receiver spot. That – You know, Tech's DBs were just, I mean, they were on everybody. We couldn't seem to get anybody open, um, and we couldn't move the ball in the passing game because of that, amongst other reasons. We don't really have that problem anymore, and Josh Downs is a big part of that. Um, For the last two games, what he's shown is that he can take the top off of the defense, and what he's – what's – what's what that's allowing us to do is it's getting other guys the opportunity – you know, to run, you know, deep verticals to, to, to get open deep because now you have to respect a guy like Josh Downs on underneath routes because he's so shifty. As soon as he catches the ball, he's going to get more yards. I mean, he is a, he is that, that, you know, for the last several years, we've had, you've had Ryan Switzer, you've had Daz Newsom, and now you got Josh Downs as sort of that, you know, that midsize shifty, smaller receiver 
um, but who can be your primary option in a pinch, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you need him, when you need a first down, whenever you need yards, you need a big play, you can turn to that guy, throw the ball his way, and chances are he's coming down with it um, for positive yardage in a big situation. You know, he is just continuing that line, that lineage of, of good. I don't, I don't even really want to call them slot receivers. I don't want to put a label on it because the kid can play all over the field. I mean, he's, he, he is a ball player. Um, you know, so I, I, I love what I'm seeing out of Josh Downs. It's really helping the entire offense, knowing that they have that, have that option and guys are benefiting from it, you know, indirectly, a guy like Choffrey Brown, right. Catches a touchdown. He takes off, you know, he, he beats the defense. He scores a touchdown. I hadn't seen that sort of thing from Choffrey Brown all season long. Yeah. That's a confidence play. And he's doing that because he's seeing Josh Downs doing it. He's going, well, I got to do it too. Plus, you know, Choffrey had his brother on the sidelines, but still it's like, you know, Josh is doing that. So I got to get mine too. You see Antoine Green coming up with catches. You see, you know, Turner Walston. That's a guy who needs a shout out. All right. Talk about Garrett a redemption. Walston. Garrett, Garrett with Turner Walston. Sorry. Turner, if you're listening, I hope <laughs> you're doing well. <laughs> shout out Turner Walston. <laughs> Garrett, I, Garrett Walston. I do that 10 times a season, and I'm sorry, Garrett. Um, Garrett Walston, redemption story. All right. Yep. Everybody was all over him. He was getting destroyed on the internet after the Virginia Tech game. All right. And he had a bad game at Tech. He, he did. I think he'd probably be the first one to tell you. He's another guy who's come along. Last week against Georgia State was was a big factor in the run game, big factor in protection. This week he was a he put it all together. He was a factor in the pass game. He was a factor in the run game. He was a factor as a pass protector. Um, so all these guys are benefiting indirectly from a guy like Josh Downs having big, huge games and being able to control a defense and take eyes off of them. So now as secondary options, they're able to – now they're getting their separation because you've got DBs that are peaking, looking where Josh Downs is. Defensive coordinators are going to have to start scheming a little bit for him, rolling coverages in order, to, in order to account for wherever Josh is on the field, that sort of thing. And that's only going to have a, a, a continued positive impact from an offensive standpoint throughout the remainder of the year, or so we can hope. Yeah, I think what separates Downs from other receivers we've kind of seen in the past for Carolina, it's, it's, it's his acceleration, his, yeah. his ability to get to top speed. It's, it's unbelievable. That, that little short pass that he turned into that huge touchdown, it was like he just kept hitting another gear, another gear, another gear. When a defender would close on him, he would hit that other gear and just start pulling away from defenders where – if when he caught that, I was like, oh, this is going to be like a nice 20 yard gain. And he just kept going and going and going until he scored. What I couldn't believe was the play right before Sam threw the almost pick six in the end zone where Josh got it down to the five or the six nice. yard line. And he spun it. Yeah. And he, well, he, in, in order, he, he spun, but he also, spun, unless I'm thinking of a different play, same part of the field, he split two guys mm. on just a little crossing route, mm. got the ball and split two guys that were closing in on him. He was dead in the water and you're, and you're exactly right. He put his foot in the ground and that acceleration, he split those guys and almost took it to the house when he should have been done after two or three yards. And the other thing I saw him doing, he deserves a lot of credit for this is blocking downfield. That's something else that's made mm -hmm. our passing game very effective for the last few years is guys like Deami Brown, right? Daz Newsom, they're willing to Bo Corrales, you know, when he was healthy, um, you know, and, and on the field, our wide receiving core has always had a penchant for blocking. They've been very good at it. They've shown a willingness to do it. And I saw Josh throwing blocks downfield and really taking pride in that. That stuff's infectious in a room too. Just like guys like Choffrey Brown now, you know, outrunning a defense because he's got to get his right and scoring and kind of, you know, and, and, and getting his stats up a little bit too, because he knows Josh is doing it. So he can't get, you know, <laughs> he can't be left behind. The same thing happens with blocking. And sort of the dirty work that, you know, you don't really expect wide receivers. You don't think of, you know, wide receivers being good at or really a, a, a primary component of their job responsibilities. Um, but that stuff has an infectious uh, effect on that wide receiver room, too. So if Josh is going to continue to do that stuff, you know, it'll help our it'll help our passing game in more ways than one. Yeah, I think also on the topic of of Josh Downs, since the Orange Bowl, Everything you heard in the offseason, every time Mac Brown talked, he was like, Josh Downs is not good. Josh Downs is great. And it it's almost to the point where it feels like Josh Downs has surpassed even everybody's expe expectations of him that were already super high. Like he leads all power five receivers with 399 receiving yards through three games. And it's like 
if he can keep this up and this pace, this pace might not be sustainable going for 200 plus yards uh, a game against Virginia, even though Carolina, if Carolina were to play Virginia every year, I think it's, uh, there's a good chance somebody's getting 200 plus yards. Diami did it twice and now Josh Downs did it. But if Josh Downs can even be, you know, 75% of what he was uh, yesterday or whenever people are listening to this on Saturday, the Bolitnikoff award, it's, it could be coming to Chapel Hill, which, which sounds crazy to say with how many great receivers there are, but Josh Downs has started to put himself into the conversation. I think uh, just like a quick story from yesterday, uh, from Saturday, when I was at the game, I took one of my uh, best friends from uh, that I grew up with in New York and he doesn't have any affiliation to Carolina. And after the first two drives where down scored touchdowns on both of them, he turned to me, he's a Jets fan. He was like, I want Josh Downs on, on my team. Like he had no idea who Josh Downs was uh, before that game. And then after that game, he was like, Josh Downs is my number one on my big board. I was like, you have to wait another year before he's even draft eligible. But he's like, uh, he, uh, the Jets fans will wait for, for more talent to surround around Zach Wilson and Michael Carter's already there. But EJ, you mentioned earlier, Defensively, Carolina made some changes, inserting Kamon Rucker, Cedric Gray into the starting lineup. Getting more specific, what did you kind of see from them? Because I thought Rucker especially made a difference up front with his pass rush, picking up two sacks, and he's got the he's got the butcher nickname. What do you what do you think about the butcher <laughs> nickname for for Rucker? I think it's very appropriate. I mean, I think even coming in, I mean, last year, I, I mean, every time I see this guy play, I think about um, when, when I saw him playing the bowl game, how well he used his hands on some of those plays, and he was making splashes in both the, uh, the running game and against the pass. So, I mean, I think that name is absolutely appropriate. I mean, the guys, I mean, he, he he's a beefy guy. I mean, the guy is huge out there, and I think he, he does a really good job in every aspect of the game. I mean, even his his effort uh, getting to the ball. And uh, Cedric Gray, he, he may not made a lot of the splash plays but just to see him out there in his real first real extended playing time and how well he played he didn't make any mistakes he looked like he knew what he was doing he knew the playbook well and he kind of added some much needed stability to that part of our defense so I mean those guys made an instant impact and it's good to see young guys like that I mean it, this kind of goes to the point where Mac Brown and the coaching staff says that most of our talent are, 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 are freshmen and sophomore they're young guys who are just now coming along and I now I think uh, in game three you're starting to see some of that benefit of these guys playing last year you're starting to see the benefit of guys like Jaquarius Conley uh getting getting so much time in the um, Orange Bowl game and guys like um guys like Rucker and then some of these other guys that are coming along so I mean they're just giving Jeremiah Gimmel and Ray Vahasek and all those other uh stalwarts and studs that we have on defense so much needed backup and it's just excited to see pass rush coming from both sides to see Taman Fox and to see um Rucker uh rushing each other racing each other to the passer What's really been coming disappointing to me over the last couple of seasons is really the development of Dez Evans. I really don't, for some reason, he's not developing and coming along like all the other players are. I mean, I haven't really heard any stories coming out on, on the offseason about him, but it just seems like he's making a lot of mental mistakes and we're not really seeing him unleash that athleticism like I thought he would be at this point. But I definitely see those two guys uh, come in and I think uh, the better they get, the better we're going to be uh, as a defense defensive unit. Yeah, you've mentioned how the thing that gets people excited about this defense is the young talent. You have sophomores like Rucker, like Tony Grimes, Cedric Ray, Jaquarius Conley, uh, Miles Murphy. There's a bunch of young talent, but what does it do for a defense when you do get great performances from a sixth year senior in uh, Taman Fox, who was on this team the last time they beat Virginia in 2016, which feels like, you know, ages ago where he has six tackles, he has uh, one sack, four quarterback hurries where the the secondary might not have done their job entirely, but you are starting to get pressure from a guy like Tamon Fox, who career wise has more sacks than somebody like Lawrence Taylor, which sounds crazy to say. It really does. I mean, I mean, we, <laughs> I would get into some LT jokes, but I love LT too much. And I don't know if he's going to listen to this uh, podcast or not, but I think Mike knows where I'm going with that. Either way, I, it has to be exciting for Taman to kind of have some guys to, to come along with him for a long time. He was the lone source of pass rush for that defense. I mean, before his younger brother got there and some of those other guys, he was the lone source of, of pass rush. Um, 
now he has he has Rucker, he has Des Evans, he has uh, Chris Collins, he has a lot of guys coming off that edge who are ferocious and uh, as tenacious as he is. I mean, he's a little bit more crafty. You can see that in some of his pass rush moves and just how he executes a lot of the pass rush games. But I think he's excited. I mean, he, he's kind of been been in the mix. He's been inside pass rush and outside. So I mean, it's it's kind of how I felt. I mean, not saying that I was a pass rusher, but after playing with uh, guys like Kentuan Bomber and Holly Taylor. For me, uh, my last few years to play with a, a, a Robert Quinn, to play with a Quinn Copels, a Michael Mackett doing some of those guys. I mean, it, it made me kind of what Mike was saying about the wide receivers. It made me step my mm-hmm. game up and want to be a better pass rusher because it's like when we're all hanging out on the weekends, I mean, yeah, we may not all have sacks, but I mean, you have to win on a couple of pass rushes because when, when you're in that film room, those are the things that we brag about. I mean, we've seen film a million times, so you have to get some kind of comfort, especially when you're playing linemen. Um, like, and Mike will tell you, I mean, he, if he get a pan, if he gets a pancake block, whether it be on play side or not, that's something that he's going to talk about mm-hmm. with the rest of his teammates and his O line buddies <laughs> because it's like, hey, I'm out here playing hard. I, I'm doing what I need to do. What are you doing? So it's a, it's friendly competition. So um, I know he's excited to have those younger guys, and you're really seeing it come through in this play. A bunch of people came up to me in Keenan Stadium on Saturday night, told me how much they like the pod, how how this is a, a podcast that is keeps expectations realistic. They not afraid to say, you know, what's, what's going on. Uh, not that's all. A, that's very diplomatic. It's a dip, not, diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> I was yeah, trying, yeah. trying to figure out a <laughs> best way to say it. We're not pumping sh- sunshine 24 um, seven. But I think we, people- we got accused of that a year ago. You remember that EJ? We got accused oh, of yeah. being too yeah. positive and too rosy and too company line a year ago. And now people are saying we're being too negative. Make up your damn minds. <laughs> I think part of it is due to expectations being raised and us being able to see that That's this exactly team, it. this team at their best, they, the standard should be a lot higher, but to close out the podcast, we're going to try out this new segment where it's just called, <laughs> just say something nice. So Mike, you'll start it off. Cue, cue the game something. show music. Dun, 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 Mike, what's uh, your say something nice? My say something nice is we, and I think Mac may have actually said this, so I can't take credit for it, but this team offensively hasn't had an identity uh, for the first two games. And I think now they've got it. And that identity looks a lot like what it looked like last year. And that is we're going to be able to run the ball at will. And we're going to be able to throw the ball all over the field. And there's nothing you're able to do about it. And as long as we execute our assignments, I think that that identity will continue to show through. We need to string together a couple of games. I'm not trying to put the cart before the horse here. We've had one good game. We put together, you know, two, three more games here. We have a better month in October than I, than I'm predicting we're going to have, you know, we, we, we knock off more wins in October than I think I'm giving us credit for right now. You know, then I think you can lean on, we may have found an identity on offense and you can trace it back to this Virginia game because this was a nasty game. Anybody who watched Q Johnson down there getting his helmet ripped off. Okay. This is, this was a nasty game across the board. And that's how the, that's how Virginia always is. Virginia is a dirty team. This game is always dirty. It's always chippy. Um, you know, we, and we came out on top and, you know, when we minimized, at least offensively, we minimized, we minimized a lot of stupid mistakes. So I think I think we've developed a little bit of an identity, and I hope that in three or four or five weeks we can look back on this UVA game and say, yeah, that's where it all started. Great, great point right there. EJ, the mic is yours. Say something nice. Uh, I can say that it seems like we are finishing games a lot stronger-ish. Um, positive. Okay, let me start over. I'm just going to go to the numbers. I, I, I'll <laughs> ah, the numbers. Ah, that wasn't it. Dang, hang on, hang on. Let me, let me do it again. First half, <laughs> first, first half, we were <laughs> take two. We were they, they were six for eight on third down. They pretty much unstoppable on third down. Turn around the second half, they were two for six on third down. We really did a good job of getting home on our pressures. We did a good job of generating pass rush without that. I mean, you see that from Kimon Rucker, from Taman Fox, even from some of the pressure they were getting from inside. So, so all of that, all of that looked great. Um, I do think that we are. Um, um, turning a corner on um, being more comfortable with being able to rush the passer with showing blitz and not blitzing. And I do think we're doing a better job on, on getting home on some of our normal pressures. So um, I will leave it at that for the positivity pod uh, from the defensive side of the ball that we were better on third down than the second half. And it looks like things are trending upward uh, as far as our pass. Rush. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me, let me, let me say this too. 
one last thing on the positivity pod from me. Hands down, best uniforms in Carolina football history. We need to keep them. Yep. You, you took my yeah. and look, and, and look I like the Argyle. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the Argyle, I think what we got now looks good. I've liked it since we've had it. These are the best uniforms Carolina football has ever had. You, Stick you, with them. you took my point that I said uh, – ah. I. I tweeted it earlier. <laughs> I don't agree on the positivity, but I don't know if we're ready to have the conversation yet. I don't know who whose door that has to go through. Probably Bubba, but these retro jerseys should be the permanent jerseys. And we play good in them. We we played really well in them the last mm-hmm. two years. Uh, it's mm-hmm. that's all I had to say. The retro jerseys should be the permanent. I'd like to I have, see. I have no, you know, fourth wall fans. I have no original thoughts. Apparently, I steal Matt I, Brown's post game comments. I steal Taylor's Taylor's pod comments. I, I I can't think for myself. I'd like to see a, a white away retro jersey. I think. Oh, uh, Peach Bowl. Ooh, Peach Bowl throwbacks. That's mm-hmm. that's the next Jason level. Campbell. That's the yeah. next level of this progression where we have to see an away jersey. Then you know I might make a call to Bubba see if see if we can make these retro jerseys the permanent. Yeah, let let me know if Bubba takes that phone call. <laughs> he hasn't picked up yet. <laughs> he hasn't yeah, picked not up yet. <laughs> Texted him. He said, "Who who is this?" But yeah. Carolina back in action <laughs> on Saturday, September twenty fifth. Another night game, seven thirty at Georgia Tech. Well, it's at the Mercedes Benz Stadium. We'll be back next week. Break it down. Mike Ingersoll, EJ Wilson. I'm Taylor Vipolis. Guys, great talking to you. Good to see you guys. See you, man.